Well, good morning, GYC. Privilege to see you all here. This group is growing. That's a good thing. Only Ben thinks that's exciting. That's fine. We'll take it. Uh, All right. So, again, I have the privilege of sharing with you this morning uh, about this cool opportunity in the Pennsylvania Conference called CORE. Again, these postcards are at the registration table. We should have a booth hopefully later today if FedEx, UPS, or USPS, whoever it is, uh, does what I'm hoping they do, then we'll be able to arrange for that. But uh, anyway, it's a nine-month mission training school in the Pennsylvania Conference. It's for the 18 to 30-ish age range, but older are welcome. And notice I didn't say old, I said older, because I'm 33. And that's not old, Moise, and shame on you. All right, now that I got that off my chest, I just, I needed that. I needed to bring it before him individually. And if he doesn't listen, then I'll bring it before the church. And uh, so anyway, I just did it. We have work study options to make it more affordable. Super excited for that through organic agriculture and canvassing. And I think it's going to change your life. Uh, You'll learn Bible work, canvassing, digital media evangelism, health evangelism, organic agriculture, and you'll be involved in overseas missions. And we're also going to deal with topics like mental health, practical Christianity, public speaking, etc. I'll tell you more about this Friday evening uh, when more and more people keep coming. But our website is paconference.org forward slash core where you can find more information. And I'll tell you more about raw questions, relevant answers later as well. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. We're going to do a topic, again, that I have not spoken on before. Uh, but this study has challenged me and blessed me, and so I hope and pray that this is half the blessing to you that it was to me at 30,000 feet yesterday. <laughs> Maybe we should write sermons on airplanes more often. Moise and I were just, we were, it, I don't know if it's just like because you're closer to heaven, and so like the reception's better. <laughs> like the cell phone's terrible, uh, reception's terrible, but I tell you what, man, Jesus really blessed me in seat 24D. So uh, let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for this privilege to come into your presence and to pray. And again, as I prayed last night, you said that our greatest argument is the fact that we have a need. And Jesus, I need you. Uh, I've not done this before. I want to do it justice the first time around. And so I just pray that the Spirit of God would fall in this place in great power and that you would minister to us. Lord, many of us are discouraged and broken and we've not had the courage to tell a soul. Uh, And we've just wondered, how do you view me in the midst of my failures? So I just pray that you would bless us, you would speak to us, and that you would do something in this room, in this moment, that none of us would soon forget for your glory. And I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I did not come up with this title, but I liked it, so I kept it, because they did give me autonomy. I could change it if I wanted to. I could call it Purple Unicorns, but I'm not going to call it that. Um, this, this morning's message is entitled, God's Love Affair with the Guilty. And if you happen to see any typos, just ignore them, okay? Don't give me any grammar Nazi treatment right now, because I, one, I didn't go to college, and two, um, I, I, I have not had as much time to proofread this as I would like. But remember last night when I had this awkward moment when I started saying something and then just completely lost my, my train of thought? She remembered, thank you. You're not supposed to remember things like this, but you did. Well, um, anyway, I mentioned the fact that there's something that happens within our ranks, particularly among the conservative camps, that we have an emphasis on dealing with the fact that we can overcome through the power of Christ. Amen? And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. But one of the things, I was talking to Mo about this this morning, that we have had such an emphasis on sinlessness that I think we've actually missed the mark, and that's a pun intended, by the way. Um, Because sin is, what, what did we define sin as yesterday? Selfishness. So if our focus is getting sin out of our lives, the problem is that's not the underlying issue. The real issue is selfishness. And so when we have a quest for selflessness, which is what God's end goal is, you know what happens to sin? It doesn't fit into that equation. And so instead of staring at our sins, we should be staring at Jesus who died to overcome our sins and who is the perfect example of selflessness. You with me? That was the point I was going to make, so I just made it now. So we focus on sinlessness, but God is more concerned with selflessness because he knows that if we are selfless, by default, sin will leave our lives. Okay, now what I want you to do this morning is I want you to put yourself into the emotional headspace of the people that we're going to observe. I'll talk about this in my breakout session this morning, shameless plug. 
Uh, we're going to have three seminars on the topic of revival, reviving our devotional life, reviving our prayer life, and the overall topic of revival. And uh, we would love to see you there. But very often we read the text of Scripture and we just read them as if this is a story and we're just looking for facts. But we don't put ourselves in the headspace of the people that we're reading about whether it be Jesus, whether it be the Apostle Paul, whether it be Zacchaeus or whoever else. And by doing so, I think we lose sight of just how compassionate and amazing Jesus was. If you want to see, and the thing, this is one of the reasons why Desire of Ages is so amazing, is because it does just that. It shows the person's whole situation in their point of view, and it shows the thought life of Jesus in response to this person's need. Yeah, but you could have that same experience if you just slow down. And you ask yourself, I wonder what that person would be thinking in that situation. I wonder how much courage it took the centurion to even go and ask Jesus to heal his servant. Because Jesus and centurions, you wouldn't assume, because Jesus is a Jew, wouldn't play in the sandbox all that well together. Right? If you just slow down and ask some simple questions, you can find far more of the narrative. And I hope we'll find that this morning. I, yeah, I just did all that. Okay. So Jesus is a man of deep and earnest compassion, and you see that when you understand what the people are actually wrestling with and how he views them in the midst of it, which is why that phrase, moved with compassion, is laced all throughout the New Testament and the Gospels. And so he addresses their pain, but he also addresses the behavior, health, and spiritual issues, but he's willing to deal with the pain that they're dealing with, not just coming up and saying, hey, this bad habit, get rid of that. Jesus understands the reason why they had that bad habit is because they're broken. And he deals with these things. He's an amazingly holistic healer. John chapter 8, let's go there. John chapter 8, 1 to 11. Because by the laws of the Medes and the Persians, I have to be done by 930, I've been told. John chapter 8. And I don't have myself to be angry with because I have a seminar right at 930. All right, John chapter 8, beginning of verse 1. Let's just read through this narrative, and then we'll kind of unpack it some. I wish I had more time, because I would literally like to le read like eight paragraphs to you from the entire of Ages on this, but I can't. Um, all right, John chapter 8, and verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Now just imagine, first of all, where is this happening? The temple. Many times we just know that Jesus is somewhere. We assume it's outside because Jesus is going to ride on the ground. They bring this woman caught in adultery. We don't know how much work they did to cover this lady up. And they throw her at the feet of Jesus in church, y'all, in the temple. But they said, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. Ellen White elaborates on this because the, the law of the Old Testament said that, first of all, the husband would be the one that would put her to death if she cheated on him. Two, both parties should be stoned. And three, they put Jesus into one of these gotcha moments that many of us would find it very difficult to get out of because you're going to get this person mad or that person mad. But Jesus always found a way to go right down Broadway and to fix the situation. Because, first of all, if he kind of palliates the sin, he's going to be in trouble with the Jews. But on top of this, if he, if he endorses killing somebody, the Romans are going to get involved. Right? They're really trying to corner Jesus here. But Jesus, and listen to this though, they tell Jesus this stuff and say, so what, what should take place? And it's as if he hears nothing. And he gets down on the ground and he starts to write. And it's amazing. It seems rude, Right? But Jesus is answering their request, but he's not doing it publicly. They have no problem with shaming this woman publicly for adultery, which, by the way, they led her into this in the first place. He, they have no problem shaming this lady publicly, but Jesus has far more dignity and even respect for these men because they're leaders. He still has respect for them, even though they don't deserve any respect. So he doesn't point out their sin in this mass public thing. He doesn't write... Pharisee A, liar. Pharisee B, hypocrite. Pharisee C, whatever, drug addict. No one knew. I don't know what the situation is. He doesn't do any of this. He just writes the topics. Part of me now wonders, does he just write selfishness, selfishness? So I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, we keep, we keep reading here. 
as though he did not hear. Verse 7, so when, he, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he goes back to writing. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience. Notice, they were not condemned by Jesus. They were convicted by their conscience. We could learn something here, couldn't we? Jesus says in John chapter 3 and verse 17 that I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Condemnation and voices of condemnation never come from Jesus. There is a sense of condemnation and the final judgment at the end, but not in this situation. And so when we have those voices condemning us, we know those don't come from Jesus. We are told that John chapter 16 says that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, not just religious people, the world of sin. Why? It points them to Jesus, the very one who died for their wrongdoing. Conviction is directional, and it honestly is an act of love and mercy from God. If you're dealing with conviction, if you're convicted that you're not doing something you should do, you're doing something you shouldn't do, you shouldn't run from conviction because the whole thing is telling you, I value you, I love you, and the reason why I'm convicting you is because I have something better for you. Right? The woman at the well in John chapter 4 is a great example of how Jesus deals with the conviction of sin. He shows up when this woman's wanting to numb her pain. It's, a, it's a high noon, blazing hot outside. No one wants to be there at this hour of day, and that's why she's there. She's running from her problems. Her water pot is her means of escape from the issues of her life. And it's just like Jesus to show up when someone's trying to numb their pain. And you know what he tells her? What I have to offer you is vastly better than what you're coming here for. Will you take it? This is only going to lead you to thirst again, and you know it. And that's what conviction of sin is. It's a merciful act of Jesus offering us something better. And if we understood that, we wouldn't run from it. So he doesn't condemn these men. He convicts them. They were convicted by their conscience. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last, then Jesus, when he was left alone and the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus, uh, we'll, we'll close there. Verse 11. Listen to this. Jesus looked for a moment upon the scene, the trembling victim in her shame, the hard-faced dignitaries devoid of even human pity. His spirit of stainless purity shrank from the spectacle. Well, he knew for what purpose this case had been brought to him. He read the heart. He knew the character and life history of everyone in his presence. Literally, it's just like these screens flashed up and just gave their whole history, history, history. I know your story, your story, your story, your story. And he just goes to the ground and starts to write. Just amazing, the language she uses here. These would-be guardians of justice had themselves led their victim into sin, that they might lay a snare for Jesus. And giving no sign that he heard their question, he stooped and fixing his eyes upon the ground, he began to write in the dust. And remember when I said that I wasn't going to read eight paragraphs from Desire of Ages? <laughs> I may read some of them. Impatient at his delay and apparent indifference, the accusers drew nearer, and it's, this is Desire of Ages 461 and 462. Impatient at his delay and apparent indifference, the accusers drew nearer, urging the matter upon his attention. But as their eyes following those of Jesus fell upon the pavement at his feet, their countenances changed. There traced before them were the guilty secrets of their own lives. The people looking on saw the sudden change of expression, and they pressed forward to discover what it was that they were regarding with such astonishment and shame. With all the professions of reverence for the law, these rabbis, in bringing the charge against the woman, were disregarding its provisions. And then she covers some of that stuff. Let's get that. Let's get that. He had not set aside the law given through Moses, nor infringed upon the authority of Rome. The accusers had been defeated, and now their robe of pretended holiness torn from them, they stood guilty and condemned in the presence of infinite purity. And it's like a, revol a, roll, it's like a reversal of roles. This woman's probably hardly clothed, standing in shame before her accusers, and by a few strokes in the sand, boom, everything changes. Now they're the ones feeling guilty and condemned in front of him feeling guilty and convicted in front of him. And Jesus does all of this silently. But notice here, Jesus does not palliate the sin, and he doesn't condemn the woman. This is what the gospel should do. It should lead people to two things, 
acceptance and accountability. The polar opposites of our movement generally specialize in one or the other. One uplifting accountability or the other uplifting acceptance. But the true gospel should lead to both. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And I promise you, this woman was not going to be left to sin no more in her own strength. And the other thing I see in this is that Jesus is willing to silence our accusers. Amen? You don't have to defend yourself. Go to Luke chapter 19. Let's talk about Zacchaeus. God's love affair with the guilty. Luke chapter 19. Beginning in verse 1. Luke 19, beginning of verse 1. There's a lot more I'd like to say about that first story, but I just, I got, I got so much real estate I need to cover here. Luke 19, beginning of verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Some of us may feel like we're in short stature spiritually. We feel like we couldn't get access to Jesus because we're not good enough. We're not tall enough spiritually. We haven't achieved enough and we're not worthy of his time. Or there may be people in our sphere, in our circle, that make it seem like it's really hard to get into the presence of Jesus and they keep getting in our way. But anyway, he's of short stature, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus. How does he know this man's name? Make haste and come down, for today I must come to your house. Just imagine, this guy knows the life that he's been living, extorting his own people as a tax collector. And he just wants to see, I wonder if this guy really is who people say he is. He's got a tax collector that follows him as one of his disciples. I, I wonder if he would forgive me. I wonder if he would be willing to even see me. And Jesus, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, knows that this man is open and he's seeking. And as Jesus is just walking on the road, something tells him, look in the tree. Why? You never believe this. There's a person up there, not a bird, not a raccoon, not a squirrel, and he's seeking. And this is it's in the very same situation where the guy, oh, what is this guy's name? Um, so followers of Jesus tell him, hey, Jesus is the guy, and then Jesus says, whenever you were praying at the tree, I saw you. Who is that? No, who is it? Nathaniel. It's like Nathaniel, right? He gave the sincere prayer to God, and Jesus has given an answer that showed him that God heard his prayer. It's like this for Zacchaeus. Jesus says, not only I know your name, hey, why don't you have me over for dinner? I'd like to have time with you. Can you imagine what this does for this man's heart that's filled with guilty feelings and thoughts and maybe even thoughts of condemnation? What? He, he wants time with me? Yeah, he does. And he wants time with you. If you're wrestling, am I good enough? He knows the mistakes I've made. The answer is yes. Come down, he says. I'm going to your house. I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they complained, saying, He is gone to be the guest with a man who is a sinner. And the upsetting thing about this is, there are pastors with this worldview in Jesus' day. Jesus wants nothing to do with sinners. God wants nothing to do with sinners. They got problems. Jesus came to dispel that myth, regularly dispelling that myth. Jesus hung out with people that most of us would be uncomfortable with coming into our churches. Was totally fine with that. Because he knew who he was. He was secure in that. And he didn't care what people thought. He cared what the person he was ministering to thought. Because he wanted their souls. And so anyway, they say, this guy's going to be a guest of a sinner. And verse, listen to Zacchaeus, verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man also came to seek and to save that which are lost. I came looking for people like you, Zacchaeus. And he also gives him this entitled privilege to be a son of Abraham, which implies the blessings that God promised to Abraham are now going to be his. 
What was one of the promises to Abraham? Abraham, you will have a savior. He'll come through your lineage, but you will have a savior. You will have the blessings of eternal life. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's giving an affirmation and a restoration of this man's hope and the self-respect that he has lost. And many of this largely was self-inflicted. But it's just like Jesus to come looking for us. When he sees just a sign of hope and that this person is open, he calls us by name and he invites us to communion with himself. Amen? Judas, Matthew chapter 26. Whoo, man, that airplane ride and study, I tell you. It was good stuff. So Moise and I, as you're turning there, Moise and I were talking this morning at breakfast. Did you know, and you don't know, but I'm going to ask you anyway, neither of us planned on addressing the topic of selfishness when we got on those airplanes yesterday. Neither one of us. Both of us, while on an airplane prepping our messages, were both not on the same airplane, Although both of us did have a layover in Minneapolis, but that wasn't intentional. He was coming from Michigan, I was coming from Boston. Both of us were convicted to deal with the topic of selfishness. The Lord's up to something this week. I don't know what it is. I'm still learning as I go, and he's still learning as he goes. But keep praying for us and keep praying for yourself. The Lord wants to do something. Amen? Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. Now, on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand, and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, now what happens before they eat in John's account? Anyone know? No one wants to humble themselves and do the work of washing the disciples' feet. So who does it? Jesus, the Lord of glory, humbles himself and washes the feet of people who are acting like children, striving over who's going to be the greatest. So how does Jesus put an end to this nonsense? Do you think Jesus knew that he was the greatest, first of all? He showed them what living the greatest life looks like. It looks like giving, not taking. And so he chooses to humble himself and to wash the disciples' feet. And now they're having this meal, this meal here. When evening had come, verse 20, he sat with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And, as, and they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who has dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said, you have said it. Imagine what's going through Judas's mind right now. You ever been in those moments where you're on the threshold of sin and you're about to do something you know you shouldn't do? Your heart is racing and you're just on this precipice. Do I go? Do I not go? Do I go? Do I not go? And in that context, Jesus stoops to humble himself and to wash that man's feet and to serve him. Why? Because he loves him. He knows what he's about to do. And having loved his own who are in the world, he's going to love them to the end. That's how John 13 starts. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved him to the end. Then Judas betrays him. Jesus loves this man even before the betrayal. But the amazing thing is, maybe you've wrestled with temptation. I bet you, you probably have, maybe once, maybe once or twice. And when you have that scary moment when you're about to give in and you know that you shouldn't, like this, your body temperature, you just get hot, right? Your heart rate increases. Not that I've ever gone through this. I've just heard such things. <laughs> um, and your heart rate kind of increases and you're just, preacher shouldn't lie. That's a lie. I sin. I need Jesus. But it's just like Jesus to greet us with his goodness and love before we do so to seek to change our course. But some of us have convinced ourselves that, yeah, he loved me before, but when I bit the dust, game over. I get what I get. Keep reading. Go to verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, the great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. 
Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, and how does Jesus greet this man? He calls him friend. He musters the unselfish love to refer to this man as friend. Friend. Some of us in this room have people in our life right now that we cannot refer to as friend. Because what they did was too much. They went too far, and I just can't. In his strength, you can. Amen? He refers to him as friend in the midst of his heartbreak and betrayal. Jesus treating this man with far more grace than he deserves. God's love affair with the guilty. Luke chapter 23, we have the thief on the cross, and we have one more after that. And I hope I can make my deadline. Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. We know this story, right? <laughs> thought it was at GYC. I mean, it must be the wrong place. <clears throat> yeah, we know this story. So Jesus, this man is dying on the cross beside Jesus, and he finally comes to his senses and gets on the guy next to him who's railing on Jesus and says, look, we deserve to be here. This guy doesn't. And then he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus responds graciously, very graciously. Luke chapter 23 and verse 30, uh, well, 33. And when the, no, I'm going to skip to like 43. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Not in this 24-hour period, but I'm making you a promise today that in the future you will be with me in paradise. And I love this because this man does not have a track record of awesomeness. This guy does not have a track record of fidelity. He didn't come to see his need of Jesus until the end. Now, do we, do we want to make this the case study for how everybody should do life? Of course not. But if someone is in this condition, Jesus is not looking for reasons to keep people out. He's looking for reasons to get people in. Are you with me? And that's abundantly clear here because Jesus clearly meets this man where he is. He doesn't know a lot, but he does know that he needs Jesus and that Jesus is the Christ and that he personally is in spiritual poverty. And Jesus affirms that this is enough and he promises him acceptance and eternity. Amen? Jesus is in love with the guilty, and he's doing what he can to bring them in. We see this throughout the scriptures. It says in John chapter 6 and verse 37, that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one that who comes to me I will by no means cast out. You need to write this in your Bible. You need to write it on your wall. You need to put a sticky note on your car dash. You need to remind yourself of this constantly, because the accuser of the brethren keeps telling us, you are not good enough. You're not good enough. You're wasting your time. He's looking for people that don't look like you. He's returning a second time for people who don't look like you. And that's not true. He came to seek and to save, not the religious folk that all got it figured out together. He came to seek and to save the lost. He's looking for the people who are looking for him. Even the people that don't know they're looking for him. But are desperate and are searching and listen to what Ellen White says about this. She says, the message from, this is to someone who is wrestling with assurance of salvation. She says, the message from God to me for you is, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. If you have nothing else to plead before God, but this one promise from your Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. If that's all you got. It may seem that you're hanging upon a single promise, but appropriate that one promise and it will open to you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise, and you are safe. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And listen to this. Present this assurance to Jesus, and you are as safe as though inside of the city of God. If you have nothing to offer Jesus today but that one promise, you said that if he comes unto you, you will not cast him out. That's all I got, Jesus. He says that's enough. That's enough. And if some of you this morning are wrestling with these thoughts of, am I ever going to be good enough? The whole point of the gospel is, Jesus is good enough. And you can be clothed with his righteousness in a moment. When you see your need, when you confess your need, he will not cast you out. 
He will not push you away, and we see this regularly in the ministry of Jesus and his dealings with real human beings. Not just these theoretical views of how God might love me. This is how he did life, guys. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, which means that's how the Father does life. He's seeking the people who are broken and have a need. So if that's you, you got to take it in. Amen? Amen? That's you. Let's talk about Peter. Peter have any issues? He had, he had a couple. John chapter 13, beginning of verse 36. Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And this language gets repeated in John chapter 21. You're going to have a similar journey, Peter. Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus said, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. First of all, that's embarrassing. I'm just, right? In front of everybody. Peter here snapping his suspenders before the brethren, and Jesus says, no, you're going to fall. You're going to mess up, Peter. And we stop here. And then we completely separate the next chapter as if it has nothing to do with this. But the very next words out of the mouth of Jesus, a friend of mine just shared this with me this week, the very next words out of the mouth of Jesus are, let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> You're going to fall, Peter. But let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. There's room for you, Peter. I'm going to prepare a place for you right now. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming in to receive you where I am, so that where I am, there you may be also. I know you're going to fall, and I'm still making a place for you. I'm still making a place for you. Because I know this isn't the end. And you know what that tells me? That when I fall, it doesn't have to be the end. And so when Satan tells me it is the end, it's a lie. Are you with me? That's what Jesus said. I know what you're going to do, and before you do it, I want you to know that I love you, and that after my sufferings of resurrection, I still have every intention of coming back for you. But it doesn't stop there. Because when we get to Luke chapter 22, and Jesus is before this tribunal, then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean, speaking about Peter. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you were saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And then what happens? Jesus literally looks from across the courtyard and he makes eye contact with Peter in that moment, guys. In that very moment when Peter falls. He comes eye to eye with Jesus himself. You know how humiliating that is? How condemning you would feel condemned you would feel. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Listen to this. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master, and in that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. There was no anger. We think there is when we fall, but there's not. There was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, and that look of compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. I wish I saw that when I fell. It's happening, but I wish I saw it. The Savior's tender mercy, his kindness and long-suffering, his gentleness and patience towards his erring disciples, all was remembered. He recalled the caution, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, that your faith fail not, and that when you're converted, I want you to help your brethren. He reflected with horror upon his own ingratitude, his falsehood, his perjury, and once more he looked at his master and saw a sacrilegious hand raised to smite him in the face. Unable longer to endure the scene, he rushed, heartbroken, from the hall. The mercy of God literally scared him to death, and he ran. 
That happens to us, doesn't it? The goodness of God leads to repentance. Peter runs from Jesus in his greatest time of need and trial, even after encountering his compassionate and forgiving face in the midst of his fall. You ever been there? You encounter grace that you don't deserve and you just run from it because you're trying to disqualify yourself. Jesus, you can't give me grace right now. I don't deserve it. Here he is trying to embrace you and help you after you fall. And saying, no, stop it. Get away from me. And yet he still chases us down and he doesn't give us rest because he wants you in. Because he believes in you and he doesn't define you based upon what you do. Jesus does not use shame. Maybe your family did. Maybe your culture did. Jesus doesn't. He defined himself by what you did so that you could become the righteousness of God in him. But it doesn't stop here either. In John chapter 21, when Jesus is restoring Peter, I'm sure you've heard this story before. If you haven't, it's a great narrative to read. John chapter 21. He's walking on the beach with Peter after the resurrection and says, Peter, do you love me? Well, first of all, when he's resurrected, he tells him, go tell Peter that I'm here. Yeah? And one of the gospel narratives are told, go tell so-and-so and Peter. Remind him. But then whenever Peter's walking with Jesus on the shore, he says, do you love me, Peter? Do you agape me? Do you have complete, unselfish, other-centered love for me? And he says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I have human love for you. I can't give you what you're asking. This is the best I have, Jesus. Because remember before, whatever you need me to do, I, I got it. I can handle it. Peter gets it now. He fell on the rock and was broken. He says, look, the best I have to offer you is human love. I'm sorry. But if you'll take it, I'm in. Then he says, Peter, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. Then Jesus meets the man where he is and says, Peter, do you phileo me? He says, yes, Lord, I do. Then Jesus tells Peter what it's going to cost him, and it's hard. Remember, you will come with me later, he said. Peter himself will be crucified and die on behalf of Christ. But he still gives him the invitation to follow me. Amen? Jesus loves him before he falls, even though he knows he's going to do it. He loves him while he's falling, and he loves him after his fall. He's in love with the guilty guys. Absolutely in love with them. The only reason why Jesus would do this and bear along with people and love them in spite of who they have been is because he sees something of value in them that they don't even see in themselves. This, beloved, is the faith of Jesus. Seeing something in you that you don't see in you, and he loves you to the end. I'm not going to steal your thunder. Just give me like a few seconds on this. Generally, we separate Revelation 3.20 from the Laodicean message. They're not separated. The very people, so in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And in the Greek, that's actually in the continuative, which means that he has been knocking, he is knocking now, and he has no intention of not knocking tomorrow. And he says, if any man opens, anybody, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Who's that invitation being given to? And who's he being so persistent with? According to a few verses earlier, it's the same people that make him want to vomit. Even us. We're hot, we're cold, we're hot, we're cold. We don't even know who we are. We just had this massive identity crisis. Yeah, I'm still knocking. And I'm not leaving here until you let me in. Or until there are no more chances for you to let me in. Listen to this. This is from E.J. Wagner. God chooses men not for what they are, but for what he can make of them. And there is no limit to what he can make of even the meanest and the most depraved if they are only willing and believe his word. Amen? Amen. There is no limit. Picking up on the same theme, Ellen White says, talking about the man at the pool of Bethesda, through the same faith we may receive spiritual healing. By sins we've been severed from the life of God, our souls are palsied. And of ourselves we are no more capable of living a holy life than was that impotent man capable of walking. You are no more capable of living a righteous life than a paralytic is of getting up and walking. You can't on your own. There are many who realize their helplessness and who long for that spiritual life which will, impart into, which will bring them into harmony with God, and they're vainly striving to obtain it. You ever been there? Vainly striving? 
In despair they cry, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But let these desponding, struggling ones look where? Look up. The Savior's bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Will thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Then she says, Do not wait to feel that you were made whole. If that paralytic was waiting for some holy mojo feeling in his legs, he never would have walked. He had to believe what Jesus said in spite of what he felt and in spite of what he saw. And we're asked to do the same thing. Faith is believing that the Word of God will do what it says that it will do and relying upon the Word only to do what it says that it will do. Put your, so believe His Word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ, will to serve Him, and in acting upon His Word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion which through long indulgence binds both soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. Amen? Doesn't matter what you're struggling with, what you're wrestling with, Christ can handle it. But will you come? And will you take him at his word, that him who comes unto me I will in no wise cast off. And when a man is in Christ, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you believe what the word says? So you may feel that your whole life has been a disaster with no potential to bear fruit. There's no hope. And you don't think it's worth wasting any more of Jesus' time. Just move on, man. I don't put out. I've been sitting here year after year after year. I'm no good. You know what he says? Give me one more year. It's in Luke chapter 13 about this tree that doesn't seem to want to put out. And they say, look, just get rid of this thing, man. Why waste your time? He says, no, no, no. Give me another year. Let me fertilize it. Let me invest in it. Give me one more chance. He's asking you to do the same. Would you let him? Many of us have shamed ourselves out of heaven. We'll continue to keep our parents happy, don't want to look, make our friends think we're lost and get too much attention. I want them to leave me alone. I'll just kind of tread water for a while. But inside, we died inside. He's saying it doesn't have to be that way. I have something better for you. Again, King David in Psalm 27 says, I would have lost heart were it not for the fact that I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In the land of the living. Listen to this. By the way, if you have not read this book, it's amazing. Testimonies on Sexual, adultery, uh, sexual Behavior, Adultery, and Divorce. This book is just filled with the gospel. She says some pretty scandalous stuff too, by the way, but this is amazing. Listen to this. There's some amazing gospel appeals to people who are broken and dealing with some stuff in life. You ever dealt with stuff? Yeah, she talks about it. Listen to this. We need good heart religion that we shall not only reprove, rebuke, exhort with all, lust, all long suffering and doctrine, but we shall take the erring in our arms of faith and bear them to the cross of Christ. We must bring them in contact with the sin-pardoning Savior. I hope that we've seen very clearly this morning that God has a love affair with the guilty, but my question is, do you? How do you do church? How do you do Adventism? And our side of the aisle has more of a tendency to kind of wrestle with some of this stuff because we believe that there are standards and those standards to some of us have become the end instead of a means to an end. And in turn, we get ourselves in trouble because we think if someone isn't eating this way or, or dressing this way, they're lost. Totally. If this person doesn't know Jesus, look at them. You don't know them from Adam. You don't know their heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but where does God look? At the heart. Only God knows. By their fruits, you'll know them. Yeah, but you don't know if anyone has even educated them. How many of our schools are actually teaching these principles? How many of our homes are teaching these principles? And then you're going to have the audacity to judge this person for something they've never heard? And if they have in a very Christless and, and authoritative way? Me getting in somebody's face and saying Sunday's the wrong day, get with the program, I did not give them the Sabbath truth. And they will not be held accountable for receiving Sabbath truth, though I may think they will be. How do we do church, guys? Do we have a love affair with the guilty? Are we willing to have the faith of Jesus that the saints are supposed to have? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus. They are choosing to see people the way that God sees them and treat them accordingly, which must mean that that's why Revelation 18 says that the saints reflect the character of God to the world. Yeah, but if I'm judging all the people around me while claiming to be holy, I cannot be giving the loud cry. I can't be. And I'm not preaching present truth. 
because I'm not reflecting the true character of God, which we've been talking about already. You with me? But she doesn't stop there. Listen to this. I am more pained than I can express to see so little aptitude and skill to save souls that are ensnared by Satan. She was heartbroken by how merciless Seventh-day Adventists were with the airing. I see such a cold Phariseeism holding off at arm's length the one that's been deluded by the adversary of souls. And then she says, and then I think, what if Jesus treated us this way? What if Jesus treated the people in my community the way that I treat the people in my community? What if Jesus treated my children the way that I treat my children? What if Jesus treated the people around me in the way that I treat them? None of us could be lost. None of us could be saved. None of us. What if Jesus treated us this way? Is this the spirit to grow among us? If so, my brethren must excuse me. I cannot labor with them. I will not be a party to this kind of labor. And the unfortunate thing is, the people who are doing these very types of things are the ones who are claiming, spirit of prophecy, she says it, get with the program, work harder. There are standards. Don't avoid them. We should not shirk from our call to be a peculiar movement. We should not. But if we are not uplifting Jesus as we uplift the standard, we have failed our prophetic calling and identity and shame on us. But even then, there's a Savior that has a love affair with us being guilty. Amen? Amen. He'll still bear along with you. He'll heal the wounds that you cause, just like Peter. We're just like Peter. We're hacking Malchus's ears off all over the place, thinking we're helping Jesus with our violent arguments. And you know what he says? Put your sword in its place, Peter. I don't need your violence. You know what he says? They're not taking my life. I'm giving myself for them. The way this battle is won is by giving, not taking. And we are meant to be champions of religious liberty, are we not? The 1888 revivals were happening by preaching two things, not just righteousness by faith, liberty of conscience. So we need to teach our children to self-govern, not over-control them. Self-governance. That means we still have standards, but we're teaching them how to live these things out on their own so that when they leave the home, they don't go buck wild. And we wonder why kids who grow up in these environments with all these standards just go crazy. We, we taught them better than this, we'll say. Yeah, we knew what you told them not to do, and they obeyed out of fear, but they never learned to think for themselves. They were reflectors of the men's thoughts around them, and they were just obeying to stay out of trouble. Here's where it gets scary. What we really have done is we've groomed them to fall in the Sunday law crisis because they were trained to obey to stay out of trouble. What do you think is going to happen when stuff hits the fan? Bow the knee or go in the flames. But if we taught them to think for themselves as to why God gave us these principles, why they draw us closer to Jesus in our best interest, well, I don't want to do the other things. You with me? Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you that you have a love affair with the guilty, that you love us even when we've been unlovable that you believe in us even when we've been unbelievable. And God, I pray that we would receive the faith of Jesus for our own experience and for the benefit of our children, for the benefit of our friends, our family, our church, our community. Lord, I pray that we would see people who are struggling in sin the way that you see them, not to palliate the sin, but I pray through our loving example, we could bring them to a Savior who can set them free. They don't have to remain like that. Help us, Lord, to live that appropriate example and reflect the true character of God's unselfish love to the world as we were commanded to do in Revelation 14 and Revelation 18. May we live up to our potential in Adventism, I pray. And I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.